evening, good evening, and welcome to The Caring View, the online health and social care platform free to access for absolutely everybody. Before we get started, if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and tap that bell. You'll get notified of all of our um, episodes as they go live and everything that's coming up. Uh, if you're on Facebook, bear with us. I'm sure we'll try and fix that in a second. Uh, LinkedIn, make sure you are following us and subscribe to our newsletters and all of that fancy stuff. Go to www.thecaringview.co.uk for all of our information episodes of our podcast episodes of our show our cqc hope which um it is the 6th of february that's it everyone is under the new framework now um whether um it's working or not we shall see but we're getting email notifications now to say that those new reports are out there those new inspection framework reports are out there so if you have had an inspection on the new framework, please do get in touch. We would love to know. Um, for those of you still preparing, we do have our CQC hub up on the website and we will be doing a catch-up show in the near future. Follow us on all of our socials. Uh, don't follow me. Follow Mark. I'm crap at social media. I've not been on it for God knows how long. Mark's always on it and it's an absolute angel on social media. So go and follow him. I'm one of your hosts, Alan Pennell, and I am joined in Kofta tonight by... Hello. Hope everybody is well. Very nice to see you again, Jane. I hope you're keeping well. I am. Thank you. Well, he was supposed to say Mark Top, so I'm joined by Mark Top. So <laughs> it's one of those nights tonight, people. We're in for a show. Um, and uh, we have the Caring View royalty back with us tonight. Um, and, oh, Director of Workforce Strategy at Skills for Care. Dr. Jane Brightman. Jane, how are you? Hello, I'm good, thank you. It's lovely to be back. I was trying to think when I was last on the show. It's ages ago. It's probably about a year ago, I think. Yeah, you ghosted us for a while and then like never I got in touch. Ghost you. <laughs> I could never ghost you two. <laughs> we would not let you. We just would not let you. No. I, I miss you so much, Jane. I feel like the world has changed recently and we've all gone into even bigger, more important jobs and have less and less time to do the stuff that we really love, which is socialise and drink cocktails and go to care shows, which I don't drink anymore. Believe it or not, six months since I had an alcoholic beverage. And wow. I honestly, I feel amazing for it. I think other people should really look into it. It's really beneficial. One of my only resolution things that I've stuck to for a long, long time. Amazing. Um, but enough about me. We have Mark, who's sat in Costa, so he will be on mute unless he's talking, because we've got the whole of London in there by the sounds of it. M last week, it looked like I was having a power cut. I wasn't. I've got dodgy light fittings, so I might go in and out of light this evening. Um, so, Jane, you're on You're on your own tonight to basically talk us through Skills for Care's vision. But before we do, what is this new fancy role that you're in? What does it mean? And um, what are you doing now? What am I doing now? So I came back to Skills for Care in October 23, because, as you know, I worked at Skills for Care for five years before um, and then left and uh, had some time at the Institute of Health and Social Care Management and then had two years in the digitising social care team and have now just joined Skills for Care again. So um, I am leading the development of a workforce strategy for adult social care. So you'll know there is an NHS workforce strategy that was um, launched last year. Uh, I think it was about April time last year, um, but doesn't cover social care for obvious reasons. So it's huge. Um, and they had enough on their plates with just the NHS workforce. Um, and we don't have a workforce strategy in adult social care. So um, owner, who's the CEO of Skills for Care, um, sort of talked to lots of different stakeholders across the sector and made the decision that skills for care were going to lead the development of one so um that's what i'm doing um so we are leading it but but it's not a skills for care strategy so we're really keen to say this is a strategy for the sector by the sector not for skills for care so yeah that's what i'm doing um we intend to launch the strategy in the summer so around july time which is quite ambitious but it's absolutely doable with a strong wind behind us um, and we wanted we want it obviously to be ready before a general election and all of that kind of stuff and we're assuming that the general election will be in the autumn so yeah that's what that's i'm up a to pretty brave assumption jane not to make this you know <laughs> the andrew marr show but 
the shifting of budgets and shifting of cabinets and MPs resigning at the moment. I mean, Quasi Cardsen is stepping down as an MP now, from what sure. I've seen. Thank God he ruined my mortgage hopes. Well, I've got a mortgage, but because of him and trust, I'm screwed with a thousand pound mortgage for three bed terrace. So I'm not that sad about him stepping down. Yep. I, I'm seeing I'm seeing an early birthday present for me in May with a bit of a surprise um, in election. I, I don't know. We're confident for autumn, potentially. I do think it might be a little earlier this year. I think they might try and capitalise on a few things, but let's see. Um, really exciting stuff. So you're you're basically you're you're banging the drum for us at the minute in social care. You're getting our voice heard. You're helping us set out that sort of future um, for our workforce moving forwards. One point six million people in social care at the minute. Is it? Yep. Yep. Um, we still got a deficit of five hundred thousand or whatever it is. We've got a deficit of around one hundred and fifty thousand vacancies. Um, and but the projected our, deficit a few years ago by 2030 so, was around 500, wasn't it? So our latest data tells us that we will need, just to stand still, we will need another 440,000 care workers in the next kind of 12 years time. So, yeah, it's quite stark, really. Really is quite worrying. I know, I know we've got um, sponsorships now that are out there. Um, they're coming with their own concerns at this moment in time. They're under a lot of controversy themselves, how they're being managed, people being brought over and not being given the hours that they're supposed to be having. This, this, this strategy you're creating, what is it like? What are the focal points on it? Yeah, so um, let's walk you through the the way that we're setting it out first. So, um, so we've convened a um, steering group of um, lots of kind of people across the sector representing different parts of the sector. So we've got the care providers represented. We've got people drawing on social care represented in that steering group. Um, we've got all of the regulated professionals that work in social care. So our social workers and nurses and our OTs. Are represented so all of the kind of royal colleges and the regulators etc cqc are represented on there um we've got a few um ceos from some of the ics's kind of dotted around the country so we've gone for a good mix across the country ge geographically and we've got the local authorities and sort of lga and adas represented on there so really good kind of steering group of, of people who like the movers and the shakers that can really make things happen which is quite exciting they sorry did um, i see tlap have been involved at some point no you've adopted some of tlap's work to be involved in it as well yeah so tlap are involved so clinton sits on that steering group as well and um we are ensuring that we're embedding things like the social care future vision so yeah really really kind of representing people that draw on social care Perfect. throughout yeah yeah um, so Ona is co-chairing the strategy with um, Sir David Pearson, who was a uh, DAS in Nottingham for many years. And then he chaired ADAS for a long time. And then during the pandemic, he led the COVID task force, forces for social care for DHSC. So what he doesn't know about social care, we could write on the back of a, on a, of a postage stamp. It's quite exciting to be working with the two of them. Um, and they've convened that steering group. So the steering group have met four times now and they had a face-to-face -face, um away day a couple of weeks ago in london um where they were focusing on some future service assumptions um because although we're not writing a service strategy we need to think about what the future is going to look like in terms of how we think social care will be delivered so that we know how to work back and think about the workforce um, and then the steering group um are being supported by seven expert working groups who are all looking at different themes um, or chapters of the strategy, if you want to describe it that way. Um, and our mark sits on one of those. <laughs> um, so the topics for those expert working groups are science, tech, AI and pharmaceuticals. So think of that as kind of your innovation, all of that sort of stuff. Then we've got one on integration. Uh, then we've got one on prevention. And then we've got one on what we've called new service models and multidisciplinary working. Um, and then we've got three that relate to kind of uh, sort of employer actions. So we've got one that's recruit and retain. We've got one that's develop and train. And then the last one's leadership. Um, and we've got experts drawn from right across the sector <clears throat> who are sort of sitting on those groups and helping us to develop the recommendations for those particular themes. <clears throat> and then we've also pulled together a um, 
what we've called data and economics work stream. So we've got all our kind of intelligence in, internally in skills for care, so our data analysts and um, all of our kind of really clever boffins that do stuff with data. And we're also bringing in some economist expertise as well. Um, and we've formed, yes, very exciting. And we formed a uh, research and academic panel as well. So we've got some kind of key researchers and academics from across social care and they're all coming together and what they're going to do is crunch the numbers and kick the tires on the recommendations that the expert working groups make so they will say do those stack up what does the data tell us what does the evidence say will that work how much will it cost is there ever going to be enough money to do something along those lines so it's really going to be kind of evidence-led strategy i mean I, i'm i'm you I love you to pieces, so I'm going to be really, really positive about this. I mean, first off, data. If you're not filling out your Ask WDS, um, Adult Social Care Workforce data set for those who aren't on the down low with us, make sure you are filling in your Ask WDS for all your new starters, your leavers, keep you up to date each month, use it as a workforce tool. That would really help Jane and her team down at Skills for Care. But Jane, my only one pessimistic question of tonight, and I have to ask it to be impartial, it sounds expensive, like it sounds really expensive what's the what's your projected outcome from this you know if it, if it's going to be costing the, the the money it's going to be costing what sort of um impact are you seeing this having is it going to go these are the solutions and this is how we're going to implement it or have you got concerns that this still might be just another sitting on the shelf piece of work that we've seen happen so many times in social care i know that's not your personal intention but how, how are we working to make sure that this is actually the start of something new now yeah. So when you say it sounds expensive, you mean the way it's being developed sounds expensive. Is that right? Yeah. There's a lot, I know a lot of it will be volunteers and I totally yeah. get that. But, you know, we have to pay consultants. We have to pay the analysts and, you know, it, things do cost. I had the same conversation with the ICB recently. They put a nice fancy report for our local area. And I'm like, great. What do we do with it now? <laughs> How much is yeah. it costing? If we're not going to do anything with it, could that money have gone directly to social care in this area? You know, yeah. it's one of those things. I'm not saying that this is going to be the case, but there'll be people watching this going, oh, heard all this before what's different yeah. now yeah totally i think what's different is that we are in a space now where those leaders and influencers in the strip in the steering group have very much kind of said it's time we did this and we took responsibility and we did some of this for ourselves yes there will be some recommendations for a new government absolutely and that's the right thing but there will also be blueprints for commissioners, so integrated care systems, local authorities, NHS commissioners, and blueprints for employers. And we will be saying, come on, it's about time we galvanised around something as a sector and we had a shared voice and a joint voice and we did this together. And that means we all have a part to play. So Skills for Care will have a part to play. Care providers will, commissioners will, CQC will, and everybody has kind of put their hands up and said, you know what, we're up for that. So I'm not sure we've ever been in that position before. And I think that's why now is different. I mean, you say recommendations for a new government. I totally recommend the new government. You know, if we're going to, if we're going to be starting to recommend things like that, I'm I'm totally recommending a new government. Um, no, but you are right. It can't be all immediate. It can't be all overnight. And there is now this collective drive around fixing social care. And I hate to use the term fixing social care. It sounds, it just sounds so um in, disingenuous it doesn't sound like a real thing it means you know like you say galvanizing really building the support up. what are the biggest challenges do you think we're going to face uh well we you are going to face in, in in putting this together but as a whole implementing a vision for social care moving forwards i think yes we're in a place where we don't know what the new government's going to look like um we don't know what kind of budgets a new government is going to have um we know we've got mountains to climb in social care. None of this is easy. It's all really complex. We've done quite a big piece of work supported by the King's Fund, um, Simon Bottery at the King's Fund, looking at what's the baseline. What do we already know? What are people saying out there in the sector? What do stakeholders expect from the workforce? And we've got some really big issues to tackle. So things like what do we do about pay um, and what's affordable and what do we do about registration? Because half of the sector say we absolutely have to have registration. The other half say we can't have registration. So we've already got some of those kind of really 
you know, what we call wicked issues that, you know, we've got to find a collective voice on. And that might be that it doesn't have to be a binary decision. We don't have to all leap to saying, yes, we'll have registration in the next five years. There might be some other approach to that. And we've got to get to, to you know, around the table and go, fine, this is what we'll all work towards. So it's it's enormous. It's an enormous task. And this, I don't think when we launch the strategy, it's going to be perfect. It's not going to be the final golden leafed document that changes the world for everybody. But it's a big step forward and it's an opportunity for us to align with the NHS plan. So, we, you know, we're, we're kind of really keen to keep everything in alignment with the NHS workforce strategy so that we can as much as possible stitch the two together and give integrated care systems a really good view across the whole of their system, across the whole of health and care. Um, and also, when I say we're aligning, so it's going to be a 15 year strategy. It's going to be in two phases. So there'll be a one to five year phase, which will be thinking about a government's first term or a new term of a, a, an existing government. What will they do in those first five years that are more practical, that are less kind of spending billions from the magic money tree? and more kind of things that actually make sense just to get done and move forward and setting us up for a visionary five to 15 year strategy. And then the strategy itself, just like the NHS plan, will be reviewed every two years. So that steering group will stay together as a as almost like the guardians of the strategy, as a, you know, as a community of practice that say we're responsible for reviewing that strategy on a two year basis and, and iterating it, you know, changing it if suddenly the world changes in two years time well then the strategy needs to change totally hearing that totally hearing that and it, it's good to see that it's 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 a long-term vision and you've got it planned out and mapped out <clears throat> albeit we know that that in 15 years you know from now to the 15 years that 15 years is probably just a few lines on a piece of paper it won't be you know war and peace it can't be so fleshed out yeah. at this moment in time I know we're talking around, um, you know, five years for a new government and anything like that. How much conversation has been lent to the idea of all party um, approaches to this? Because we've got to understand that social care isn't just for the government that's in, in office at this moment in time. It's something that's affecting everyone on a daily basis. So what sort of buying do you see from the APPG on this? Or is there anything where we're saying, actually, this can't just be down to the one government in place. This has to be a unified vision across all parties and can't be used anymore as, as manifesto sort of bait. It has to be an agreement that this is what's happening now. Whoever's in party, we just need to make sure that we're fixing social care. Again, in the comments, I hate fixing social care. Mark's asked, what should we use instead? Please sound off in the comments. But Jane, yeah, APPG, you know, cross-party working, is there a vision for that? Yeah, we're, we're working really closely with the APPGs. Um, it's really difficult for us to say what will parties come together on and what will they galvanise around? What we're trying to do is create the conditions where it's almost a no-brainer for all of them to gather around. So, you know, we are not we're not writing a lobbying document. We're not writing we're not writing anything that, you know, shames any governments or pushes governments down a road that they don't want to. This is about practical. What does the sector think needs to happen? What can realistically happen? What does the data and the evidence tell us should happen? And it almost feels like if we can write something that's a no brainer and that's so good that, you know, all the parties do get behind it. And we're talking to all the parties. We're making sure that everybody understands what we're doing and is, and is as bought into what we're doing as possible. We're trying to create all the right environments for it to be a success this time. And just one last question before I come to Mark. Hopefully he's finished his latte and his croissant or whatever he's um, doing in his Costa coffee. Uh, yeah, I told you, is that a nice frappe or something? I don't think it will be chocolate. Whatever. Yeah, probably something. It's just a jar of Nutella. That's what it is. It's just a jar of Nutella. Um, why do we think, and I, I'm going to ask this in a sort of politically sensitive way, we've got into integrated care systems, boards, whatever. They've been around almost two years now. In my local area in Lancashire, we're working on this idea of a one workforce. It's going to be a one workforce of care and, and, and health. Why do you think nationally we haven't got a one workforce plan? Because health feeds into care, care feeds into health. Often the lines are blurred. We're always in MDT meetings together. Health commission care and care go in it. 
you know, all of this sort of cross working is already going on. Why do you feel like we haven't got that one workforce plan yet? Because what's what's scary about this, although it's really exciting and we're going to be fixing social care, get in the comments, what should we be saying instead? Because we're thinking this is a nice, a nice 15 year plan, it does give that concern that actually we're still 15 years away from a one workforce plan. Or do you think on this journey of this 15 year vision, there may come a point where actually, you know, like in Ghostbusters, we cross the streams and they come together and we've got that one workforce plan? Hang on, you're never supposed to cross the streams. That's weird. I know, dangerous. right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we haven't because they're two enormous workforces um, and that's just enough to make your brain explode trying to think about those two massive great workforces. But I do think there is a will to move towards that. And I think if we can get our workforce strategy good and ready and out there on the understanding that you know, it's not the final version, it's a version and it's going to move us forward and it's going to move us forward to this point. And then at this point, we might start talking more to the NHS. I just think we're creating all the right stages and all the right steps to move that forward. Can I guarantee that? No, nobody can. But I do think that when you talk to people, and I have to say myself, the team owner and David, we're talking to people about this all the time and we get nothing but really positive thoughts from people, really kind of uh, strong. How can I help make this happen? How can I support? What can we bring? What can my organisation bring? I don't think I've ever felt that sense of positivity about something from a collective point of view across the sector before so i do i do feel like we're in a moment and it's not very often i'd say something like that yeah, it's not like something i'd say every day no, <laughs> I, I do agree that it does feel like we're coming together as a collective to actually drive that forward um really interesting conversation and i i wrote down some questions so we've got the 15 year strategy and obviously you spoke about how it's going to be reviewed um every couple of years are there any short term goals that you're hoping to achieve maybe in the first year and then within the second year before obviously we get into that kind of 15 year stretch? Yeah, I think there has to be. I don't I don't think we can go another year without some changes, can we? So, um, yeah, absolutely. So um, and this is part of your job, Mark, in your expert working group. Um, as you know, you have been tasked with uh, creating those sets of recommendations and we're looking at recommendations in those first one to five years. And then in those wider years, we're looking at kind of where can we move to? What's the exciting future with technology and those kind of things? There's absolutely things that can be done. And we need to think about things that can be done that aren't going to cost a fortune. You know, things like could we explore um, different use of the apprenticeship levy that enables care providers to get more out of apprenticeships than they currently are. And we know a lot of the levy payers are giving their levy back because they just can't spend it. Now, that's just a massive pot of funding that gets wasted and gets dropped out of social care that we could make some recommendations around to do better things in social care. What can we do around the amount of waste that we in social care we have on that repeated repeated constantly repeated training that people have to do what can we do practically to start fixing some of those things in the first one to five years and then and then build from there in the future it'll be interesting as well around the whole careers and social care with that pot of money that isn't being spent actually if we invest in actually a true career pathway whether actually we'll see providers utilizing that pot of money more because at the moment i still think there's that fear that you train people up skill them and then they leave so actually all of this might intertwine well one question that i had in the back of my mind was when you were talking around some of the work with team and the voices of people that use social care how are you making sure that you've got the voice of all different parts of your of social care so older people's learning disabilities maybe those that use living care services complex care all those different parts that make up the, the wonderful world of the sector yeah, and, it, and that is one of my challenges. So, um, you know, working with people with lived experience has been um, difficult to get people from all, all kind of corners of the sector, definitely. In particular, I'm struggling to access people who are older, people with dementia, 
you know, sometimes you have to go through carers, family members. It's not the same, is it, as getting, you know, people's real views. So there's definitely some areas that I know I need to improve on. We're going to be, so we've got people in um, expert working groups and on the steering group representing, but we're also going to be running some um, sort of round table sessions with different groups from across the sector. So we'll do some groups, people have lived with lived experience, we'll do some care worker groups, we'll do some registered manager groups, we'll do some groups with learning providers. So we're going to try and make sure we're getting the voice of people in lots of different ways and through lots of different means. Um, we've also got the web page where we've got a kind of link on the web page that people can kind of express that they want to get involved. So we've tried as much as possible to just be really open and, you know, get that out there and get people engaging. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And, you know, I know from experience myself in on a very small scale trying to do something similar like this, Jane, to figure out what it is that we needed to. And Zeta has come up into the comments. And I will say, if you are watching on LinkedIn, I apologize, we're not ignoring you. Your comments aren't coming through. So I'm going to try and multitask and read both screens at the same time. I just won't be able to pull your comments up on screen. Some of them are coming through, some of them aren't. So I know myself, you know, trying to write a people plan to uh, secure or focus or enhance or recognize social care, as Zeta's put it out um, to us, that it's really difficult to get those people in. And more so for the people who are doing it in their free time is recompensing them, you know, remunerating them for their time because it's important. A lot of us attend these meetings because we're there and it's part of our working role. We get um, seconded to it. But actually a lot of people who are experts by experience or living with those experiences don't get that. You know, and we expect them to give up their time for free. And actually, this yeah. is all to help them. So surely we should be supporting them with that. And we commented and we chatted before we came live on here, didn't we, around how I'm trying to approach it uh, on a smaller scale within just my organization at the minute, because I'm doing gap analysis around training and skills development at the moment and recognizing that actually it isn't just us that are going through this. All of the providers in our area yeah. are having problems, big one being clinical skills. You know, so I'm looking at how can I actually create a team of trainer trainers within my organization so that we'll all do our own clinical training. And then potentially, how do we then branch that out across other organizations? How do we work with the local training hub? And that sort of stuff needs to be included in these sort of visions and plans. Moving forward. You know, instead of giving councils funding to give one off training to say, oh, we're going to do a catheterization course today. Actually, train 16 people as train the trainers. They will go out and train 16 people each. Imagine the spreading of the skills. I know. Yeah. I'm I'm all for succession planning. I don't mind training my entire team to be the best people they can be if they're going to leave me in five years because they're going to benefit me in that five year time. Totally. And I can just train them up in uh, train their 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 replacements up earlier on. Mark yeah. being thrown out of Costa, presumably right now for live live casting. I don't know what's going on. But it is it's it's thinking outside the box now. It's that outside it thinking. Really interesting to hear what your ideas, maybe not now, maybe over um, a glass of non-alcoholic wine sometime, um, around the restructuring of the, the the apprenticeship level, how we could use that differently, um, the workforce development fund, you know, how can we access that? Is there scope for that to change in the future for us to be able to access more of this self-replicating skills rather than training everyone en masse? Actually, would it be more cost-effective to condense it train people to train people and spread it out that way so much interesting stuff um that i think we possibly can be doing we have had one question um come through in the comments and i'm diverting to the question because i did have a point and i've got a scatterbrain tonight and i've completely forgot what it is and i'm sure it'll come back to me um this is from sarah it's quite a lengthy one so oh no it has all come up uh interesting to hear you'll be keeping the strategy live and flexible through the regular review um uh, through the steering groups uh, dr jane brackman uh, and using it as practical data-driven strategy from the sector all of this will really help ensure it makes an impact and doesn't gather dust it'll be interesting to see how it is used um and hear more about how it will be implemented mm. with that who will be responsible for implementing it? Mm. Well, that's the million dollar question. So uh, obviously Skills for Care will have a role to play and, and that will need to be agreed with the steering group where Skills for Care role, role is. The steering group will have will be the guardians of the strategy. So they will kind of look after it and, and nurture it and cuddle it and stroke it and take it forward and make sure that those reviews happen um, and make sure that, you know, things are being implemented. I think we absolutely have to do some really 
strong work with NHS England and make sure that that future trajectory of bringing the two strategies together much more, even if they're not one strategy, but they're two strategies stitched together for, for a few years. I think that has to be there has to be a role for someone in that. There has to be the use of some levers. So we need to think about things like what CQC's role in taking it forward. How does that impact their assessment? And, and they're, you know, they've been fantastic. They're working really closely with us um, and engaging with us and have said they want to help make it happen. So I think there's lots of roles that people have to play. And I, and I feel like everybody in the sector has a role to play. If it's going to be a success, we all have to sit up and take some responsibility for making it happen. We can't just keep saying over to you, government, make this happen, fix social care, fix social care, our favourite line. We've got some really good suggestions, actually. <laughs> um, we can't keep doing that. It's not going to happen. And as a sector, it's time that we took some of that responsibility ourselves. So I think we all have a role to play. Yeah. And well, I was going to say, you know, before you even started, I'm assuming the answer to this is going to be everyone. Um, now, we have had a comment in the in the, the chat and, you know, I, I'm totally unbiased on this show and I do want to bring it in, but I, I want to address it first before I come to you on it, Jane, because I think it's an important one to address. So someone said, is this not the failure um, of skills for care? Now, let's let's go back to the question we've just had and who's going to be responsible for implementing this. And the answer is everyone. I truly believe the failure of social care at this moment is actually as a result of everyone. It's a result of the large organizations out there who've relied on investment and built up empires and then sold them all off and fragmented them. I think it's a result of poor providers out there giving us a bad name through um, whistleblowing events and panorama documentaries. I think it's the fault of the governments for not giving us the right amount of funding. I think it's the fault of Skills for Care for potentially not having their eye on the ball at all times. I think it's the fault of local authorities not utilizing their funds effectively. I think it's the fault of MPs who'd rather expend floating duck baths or whatever it was when that crisis came out instead of focusing on what's real. So I personally don't think this is a failure of skills for care alone. I feel this is a collective cumulative failure of the entire country to not actually take social care correctly. Education systems, go and do health and social care if you can't pass your qualifications because you're sure to pass that one. No, Christ, this is a career. Do social care if you want to create a career, but actually the education systems let us down because go to your affair, your affairs, your events and your 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 fairs. That's what I meant to say. Your your job fairs, your recruitment fairs, um, and social care need to be seen. Oh, health, you know, go and be a nurse or a doctor or join the NHS, but actually it's really hard to get that social care representation. So that's a problem for the the education minister and the schools and the colleges and and everyone else. I've tried to dig you out of a hole there, and I think I did quite well. Would you think my answer's fair? I think your answer is very fair. It's, it, it, there's no way that it can be the failure of Skills for Care. Obviously, everybody has a part to play, and Skills for Care have done things that have improved the sector, and there are things that you know we haven't been a part of or we haven't been on the ball of. Sure, you know, absolutely, that, that would be the same for every organisation. And like you say, every care provider, every organisation, every government, it's just been successive, hasn't it, over years, neglect for the sector. So I, don't, I do not think that Skills for Care can take the blame for the problems of social care. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Sorry, Mark. I also, I was just, no, sorry. no, I was, I was just listening to you, and I, I completely agree. And I also think society as a whole, because I think, you know, actually our value of social care and looking after our next door neighbours and people in, within our local communities diminished. And maybe that's some of that's around tech and social media and we're all glued to phones. But actually, I do think that we're seeing a different model of care and a different kind of outlook of looking after our neighbours. And I think the pandemic kind of started that, but that's only growing. And actually, as we kind of move to that kind of older model that we're used to, of actually checking in on your neighbour, checking in the person over the road and making sure that actually everybody around you, whether it's family members, friends, whoever, I think actually we, we seem to be shifting dynamics and I think the younger generation can really harness that as well because I think they bring with them a completely different mindset around well-being and mental health and nurturing and that's only going to help foster what we need to achieve within social care. 
I totally agree with you, Mark. And we've had this conversation many a times. And if it's not, I mean, um, I think it's Nigel, a strategic workforce advisors in our comments on LinkedIn. Very, very lengthy comment, Nigel. I'm not reading that out, I'm afraid. But it's really supportive and he wants to hear what everyone else thinks. So please sound off in the comments around what you think about the workforce strategy. Nigel's involved and loves it. So let's get loads of feedback going that way. But we've had conversations around this in the past in how society has changed to a point where um, it's easier to film someone on TikTok struggling to have a laugh than it is actually to go over and ask them if they need support. And there are so many times it breaks my heart logging into TikTok and they're filming someone just eating their dinner on their own. And you know, I mean, I know full well how how anxious I get going to the gym on my own. Heck, going out and eating on my own, I would be paranoid that people are staring at me. But for people who are living with multiple conditions and struggle on a day-to-day basis, to be able to go out and do that independently is incredible. But then to be mocked unknowingly on social media is is terrible. There was the incident with the bus driver who was dropping off a lady who clearly had um, some sort of cognitive impairment and was saying, bye-bye driver, bye-bye driver. And he was mocking her whilst filming her on the phone. He lost his job, thank God. Um, But it just goes to show that actually social care isn't just around those direct giving care roles. I was talking to my training team today around um, dementia training and, you know, we were talking about how we want the whole team trained with, tra- with, with dementia. And maybe this is something to build into your strategy. I don't know. I'm not involved, but I don't know how far reaching it goes. I really need us to advocate for dementia training to be a standard training qualification for any public facing role. Shops, taxi ranks, libraries, buses, you know, all of those roles where people are dealing with people are in effect social care. Using a taxi to get from point A to point B, you're supporting someone to live independently because they can go from place to place. It's a social care role. You know, working in a supermarket and helping them do their shopping is a social care role. I see it all the time in my local supermarket, them taking around people with visual impairments. It's a social care role. It's part of supporting people in society to live. And we need to see social care as more of an overarching thing now rather than just a sector thing. Is your strategy going to be going that far wide or no? Am I giving you loads of work? You have, yeah. And I, and I can't <laughs> take on anymore. So the scope of the strategy will be the adult social care workforce at this stage. But there may be recommendations for wider volunteers, unpaid carers, you know, b- bigger kind of recommendations. And that you, we can't write a social care strategy without recognising the, the really important role that everybody else plays in social care. You're absolutely right, Adam. And that's something we've been grappling with in terms of the scope. But the reality is we can't write it for much bigger than our 1.6 million workforce and the data that we have. So, yeah, there will be some wider recommendations, but the the actual scope of the strategy is the workforce. But you're absolutely right. And and what you were saying about dementia training has come up quite a lot in some of the conversations that we've had. Somebody said, and I can't remember who it was, we have mandatory training for health and safety every year. And yet we don't have mandatory training for dementia. There's just no sense to that at all. So we've got to we've got to get to grips with some of these really common sense things as well. I was just going to come in and say mandating training altogether because at the moment it's so wishy washy. It's down left down to providers and registered managers based on what they think, and actually I think that leaves a massive grey area. And I, I do agree that actually it shouldn't be part of this plan and should be a recommendation, but that it's done correctly. And I kind of put in my learning disability provider hat on that they mandated LD training and they kind of rolled out stage one. But the amount of people that contacted about stage two, it still hasn't kind of rolled out and it's not gone anywhere. And I, the confusion that's led to the amount of training providers, consultants that are kind of using that, loop, that missing part, benefiting off the back of that, and they can in loads of training. And actually, there is no kind of structure around it. So I think. When we do roll out that dementia training, I absolutely think it should be key to doing it. And I think Dementia Friends started that, and we need to build on it, but actually making sure that it's rolled out right and that we've got everything kind of ticked off at the end before we actually plough into going live. Yeah, and and let's make those decisions with people who are the experts. So let's work with the Alzheimer's Society on those kind of things and really get that right and you know that it's those kind of things that I think we need to be 
explicit about in that first one to five years, don't we, where we can really make a difference and it's not going to cost £12 billion to a government, but actually it's going to have a massive impact on the sector and then we can do the more shiny stuff later on down the line when we might have a bit more money. Well, you never know, you know, shiny stuff later on down the line. Once this starts to get traction, people might start going, well, this is great, but actually we can help and we can do this. Yeah. Well, we can help and we can do this. And more people can then have that buy-in. As providers, you are absolutely right. Personal responsibility. We can't have our cake and eat it. We can no longer be sat going, we want this and we want that. But actually, in fact, I used to tell the story of the hen baking a loaf of bread. Have I told that on the show before, Mark? The hen baking a loaf of bread? And yeah. so, so there's a hen on a farm. And she's there, and she's, you know, she lives in this lovely house. She goes, I should really fancy some bread, really, really fancy some bread, and I'll, I'll condense it. So she goes out to the yard, and she goes to the pig and goes, "Pig, will you help me grab, uh, grab this wheat? You know, I need to go and collect this wheat and to make this bread." And the pig goes, "No, no, no, I'm not going to do that." Can you tell I read stories to my kids? It might not my kids, my sister's kids at night. I'm not going to help you do that. I'm too lazy. I'm enjoying the sun. So she collects all the wheat. So she goes over and she goes to the sheep, 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 please help me grind all of this wheat. I want to make some bread. And the sheep goes, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm I'm too busy eating me grass. So off she goes and she grinds this wheat and she takes all this flour and she goes to the cow and she goes, cow, cow, help me make this bread. I really fancy a loaf of bread. And the cow goes, mm, no, I'm not going to make this bread with you. Go and make it yourself. So off she goes into the kitchen, pinny on and makes this loaf of bread. And she puts it on the windowsill to cool down because you can't cut your bread as soon as it comes out of the oven. So if you are going to get into bread making, let it cool. You'll ruin the crumb. No one likes a bad crumb. So Top she tip. puts Exactly. So she puts this bread on the windowsill to cool down. And this waft of bread goes over the farm. And, oh, that sounds, oh, that smells nice. Oh, it smells better than grass. Mm, ooh, I really want some bread. So they all come walking over to the farm and they go, oh, hen, please can we have a slice of that bread? No, you can't. I asked you to get involved and I asked you to help and I asked you to be involved with this. You can't have this because you've not put the effort in. And actually in social care, it's exactly the same. If we want things to be fixed, bloody hell, put your shoes on, get off your chair and start helping and start you know, embedding social care as eaters come back into the commons. We've got to start helping make these loaves of bread for us to be able to benefit from them. No one else is gonna do it for us now. And we have to take that personal responsibility Barriers, Jane, before I get into another fable and do bloody farm animal sign songs. Oh, I'm pretty sure Adam is talking about the little red hen. Oh, that's Mark commenting. I thought someone would come into the comments there, but it's Mark in his cafe. Um, what are the biggest barriers we're going to face? I'm going to throw my hand to start. And we've spoken about government problems in, yeah. in the party groups. Other than those two big major things, what are our biggest barriers? Well, funding is always going to be a barrier. So let's park that because, you know, we are where we are. Um, I think it is making sure that everybody galvanises around it. You you said it yourself, Adam, we've had things in the past. We've had strategies and plans and things in the past and they gather dust on a digital shelf somewhere. So we've got to make sure that we don't have that this time. And that I think that is about getting everybody involved, having everybody influencing and shaping the strategy so they feel like they own it and it's something that they can work on and you know making such a great strategy that it almost is a no-brainer you know there's there is no reason why you as care providers wouldn't say why would we why would yeah there's no reason why we wouldn't pick this up and work towards it because it's just a no-brainer that's what we need to do to overcome some of those barriers um what are the barriers? Hmm. I mean, we're in very turbulent political times. We're in very turbulent economy, you know, economical times. We're in a world where technology is fast pacing us, at, you know, and we have teams that can't keep up with technology at this stage because we don't have the digital skills. Yet we are going to be relying on technology and AI to take us into a future where we're not going to find 440,000 new care workers. So I think that could be a massive barrier. So we really need to think carefully about how we get on the front foot, foot of technology and we don't let it overtake us and and, and we miss an, an opportunity. Um, and yeah, I think, I think there's some of the key barriers. 
So while Mark gets his third coffee delivered to his table, and um, that's the only reason I can think that he's turning his camera off. Either that or he's being swamped by fans because Mark's like Fun. a big celebrity on that. He's probably autographing um, yeah. lingerie as we speak. Um, <laughs> let's talk about technology then for a second because you've come from um, the NHS in quite a digital heavy role and um, a tech heavy role. Is there something about this strategy where we have to start saying, and this is going to be my second pessimistic thing of the night, is this, oh, he's gone to a new cafe. Is is there going to have to be some 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 point where we say enough is enough to the tech providers descending on social care at this moment in time with their big grants and funds, developing stuff that actually already exists in the mainstream, which funding would be better placed to reutilize stuff that exists or is there a need for constant technological development? I think things like um, AI, for example, exists for the wider public. Surely if it's good enough for the public, it should be good enough for people who use care. Alexas, Facebook portals, all of those things exist. And yet we see these new bloody robots popping up left, right and center with face screens and new ways in which you can video call people when actually that technology exists. So surely instead of granting the funds there, we should be looking at how we utilize what already exists to free up stuff. It, are we going to get to a point like that? I don't think we're ever going to stop technology suppliers, technology supplying. Like that's just not going to happen. So we as a sector need to come up with our strategy on how we handle that world. And every sector has to come up with that strategy, doesn't it? There'll be technology suppliers in transport and technology suppliers in engineering, and they'll be, you know, flooding the market with with tools and, and platforms and all sorts of things that often don't speak to each other. And you're right, they, you know, they sort of replace things that already exist in the mainstream. So we as a sector are going to need to work out how we manage that. And that probably means that we need to have proper quality standards. We need to have, you know, we need to have really good evidence about what technology works and which technology just hasn't got any evidence behind it. You know, and if technology hasn't got any evidence behind it, shouldn't be funded and you know people can make the decision to purchase it but it shouldn't be funded out of kind of central you know taxpayer money so so we need to get better at having that evidence base and that's absolutely something that the digitizing social care team are working on at the moment what we've had previously is lots and lots of little pilots all around the country doing lots of different things and none of them are scalable and none of them have really amounted to much so what that team are really trying to do are work out the big pilots and then scale them so really be able to say this piece of technology has this impact and actually the benefit sits with the nhs because it reduces admissions to hospital for example so the nhs should be funding it not care providers but this piece of technology is also fantastic and has great benefits but they sit with the care provider so the care provider should buy that kind of thing and that could be you know business software and um, rotoring and those kind of things so what we need to do is move ourselves to that position where we're much better informed as a sector and data literacy you know is and I, I've just been sat here figuring it out in my head because I remember back in school we had like these little programmable robots and then we got computers but it wasn't really until high school that I started learning about spreadsheets and word processes and that was early 2000s and if we think we've got an aging workforce uh, which we do and let's say that we've got a good chunk of our workforce over 50 which we do and a lot of those people that are over 50 are in management roles which they are We've got a bunch of people who actually, and this is this is this is not me detrimentally talking about anybody because I'm, I'm feeling their pain. Don't know Control and V to copy and paste. Don't know how to Control Alt Delete and bring up Task Manager to, talk, to you know take down processes. Uh, don't know how to disconnect and reconnect to Wi-Fi. So actually, we've got a lot of data illiteracy going on at the moment and technological illiteracy going on. And they're being piled on with all of this new technology coming in. And some of them really struggle just to navigate the basics of a computer. Is that being looked at as part of this strategy? Or are we leaving yeah. people behind? That's that's my worry. Are we leaving people behind? Yeah, yeah, yes, quite possibly we are leaving people behind. And, and absolutely that's being addressed as part of the strategy. So the digitising social care team have digital skills already within their remit 
and they sit on one of the expert working groups of so that science, tech, AI, pharmaceuticals working group. And so we're really exploring what digital skills we'll need in the future and taking that forward through the strategy. It's got to be a key part of what we do because technology is going to be a key part of the future for social care. So it's got to be a really key, key part. Mark's gone to get himself another hot chocolate, isn't he? He's gone to get himself another hot chocolate and I've had to shut my kitchen door um, and my cat's now headbutting it. So I might have to just be able to open up this kitchen door in a minute. Um, you talk to yourself? <laughs> yeah, it's yourself. No, it's, it's crazy though, isn't it? Because like my nephew can't tie his shoelaces but can work his way around an iPad. I know. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. I, I mean, know. if you put an iPad on his shoelace, he'd probably tie them. Um, no, Mark's just gone. He's like, no, I'll stuff this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to no. go get another coffee and that's that. Um, no, I think it's all incredibly interesting. I want to ask one more around demographics and representation. And, and you know, I feel like I'm putting you through the ringer tonight on this, Jane, but I think it's great to hear all this amazing work that you are doing as part of this strategy. Super diverse country, biggest strength we've got. We are a country built of, of other cultures. We are a country built from other nations. You know, crying out loud, without Windrush, this country wouldn't be what it is today. We wouldn't have the NHS if it wasn't for Windrush, yeah. you know political views aside people are people and we love people and i love people coming into this country to contribute into society as a whole you know we're we're no longer in my opinion one of these things where we've got to be talking about ourselves as a christian country because we just can't be nowadays we are a multicultural multi-ethnic country yeah how and, and not only that we are we are we are vibrant we are different genders we are different sexes we are different um relationship looking likes we are different ages we are different sizes we're different in so many ways that actually difference the new normal how's that being represented through this workforce strategy so that's a golden thread through the workforce strategy and we've got um a really strong terms of reference for the steering group um with a set of principles that they're all operating to and that's the top principle that is the everything we do is you know equality diversity and inclusion is threaded through everything that we think about so it's constantly at the top of everybody's minds you're absolutely right it's got to be an important part of recruitment of retention of our training programs leadership it's a really strong theme in the leadership group so really thinking about you know how do we get our culture of leadership and our inclusiveness inclusive leadership right all of that kind of stuff so it runs through everything you're absolutely right yeah i mean if we if, if this can start bringing an end to the snowy white peaks of, of health and care then i'm all for this i won't name the organization but they've got an equality diversity strategy in place and like oh we're so committed to becoming equality and you know and diverse and inclusive and here's the hundred director a white man and i'm like oh okay really committed to this new strategy of yours aren't you you know it's it's one of those we've got to be able to represent from all levels and i'm not just saying give people a job for the sake of giving people a job by no means that I'm saying that. And I know that people sat there going, oh, the best person probably got the job. Wrong. People probably didn't know they could go for that job because they've never seen themselves in that role. Let's yeah. give people that platform so they can actually see themselves in those positions for starters. Yeah. You know? Let's show how we're going to be representing that. Mark, are you hydrated enough yet from all your caffeine-heavy <laughs> beverages? Do you know, I chose, I mean, pastas, no appetizer here, because they shut up half nine. And then I'm like, oh, sorry, we're shutting upstairs. And I got somebody behind me, my friend that came up, and kicked me out. So I had to come downstairs, it's really annoying. I was listening there around AI and tech, and I'm conscious there's comments in there comparing social care to doing the NHS. And actually, I don't think we should benchmark what the NHS are doing because I work very closely with them, and I've got family members that work in the NHS. As we all do, and actually, there are so many data entry events in the NHS, and we look at our own personal our GP surgeries and hospitals. And actually, I think we can do better. And I actually think in terms of the, the skill set of our work, I hate myself. I'm the first to admit I really do not get it. But actually, with tools like Bing and Copilot and Chat with GBT, actually, we're going to really be able to upskill the work by just putting in simple prompts and I was using I was using chat GPT the other day to give me formulas to put into Excel that actually I would never have known before actually to be able to utilize data in a different way than I've never done so I think we always talk about the aging workforce and actually skill set being lost but actually I, I think AI has the potential to really transform the sector and I kind of look at what some of the things that 
the NHS are doing the back around memory robotics and actually some of the consultants are coming out saying that you know operations have never been so so kind of precise and to the point and I actually think we're never going to replace people in social care we always need such people in touch but actually so much that they like to be able to automate for us to give more time with our teams and more time with people that we support which is ultimately what we all want yeah. You're on mute, Adam. <laughs> I was on mute, so you didn't hear that. It's a good um, job you were on mute. mute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a PG show. Um, so I discovered a new use for ChatGPT today. We were talking about ChatGPT and OpenAI, and I'm, I'm trying to introduce my teams to it. So I'm saying not for care planning, not for personal data, not for this, not for that, but actually... How can it enhance us to achieve the stuff that we want to do? So I started talking around successful information standards, you know, and going through what that meant in different roles and areas of the organization and how I spoke about easy reads and how difficult it is to write an easy read and how expensive it is to get something converted from normal documentation to an easy read. And I said, let's try a chat GPT, chat GPT for that or open air, whatever it's called. Um, so we just went on to the NHS. What is dementia? Took a blurb of what dementia is, put it into chat GPT. Please write this in an easy read format. I don't think it fully understood me. So it just summarized it a little bit. So I was like, no, no, I need this more simple, please. That's terrible English. I need this simpler. Please write this in words with no more than two syllables. And it actually summarized the entire document for me into wow. a short couple of paragraphs into monosyllabic and polysyllabic sentences, but literally only two, two syllables, apart from things like dementia, which is always going to be three syllables. So apart from those essential words, and it really broke it down for me. And actually, what I had was a really sort of thick skeleton of an easy read document in the space of 10 minutes, which is something that would have taken me hours to write originally. And if we can use it for things like that to help bolster our accessible information standards, typing it into um, OpenAI and going, you know, write this in the most accessible format possible for people who might have learning disabilities or, you know, condense this to a way for the most salient points put into two paragraphs. Because a lot of it is superlative, yeah, is um, pointless. It's just added words for the sake of added words. We all read these documents that have got pages and pages and pages. Oh, yeah. A couple of sentences. So actually, open AI is really good for that. Mark, yeah. we've used it before, haven't we, when we've had guidance come through from, say, I don't know, government or CQC or um, uh, medication alerts, shove it into ChatGBT, take me out the most important points of this of this document, you know? Uh, you tell me what's the most important thing in this. It's so clever. No, absolutely. And I'm a massive fan of ChatGBT. I think it's really user-friendly. But more recently, I've moved over to Copilot, just because it's integrated into the web and actually the search results it gets. And to give you an example, I was writing a, a business plan the other day and I needed market research. And I didn't have time to go into market research in the time frame I had. But actually I was able just to type into Copilot, can you give me the market research for this particular area of the social care? And it pulled through the census and all this information and the data from the local authority and all that that I actually needed for the business plan. And actually I kind of thought to myself, if I've write Three AI days, how long that would take me compared to now. So I think if there is anybody that kind of wants to get into it, start with chat GPT. Don't think of it, use the free model. It's really simple. Get used to used to kind of that search function and using AI and then slowly move over to copilot. Um just because it's a bit more in depth, still free to use. Um but yeah, no, I, I can't imagine writing some of the business plans that I have to write at work, some of the things I have to do without AI now. And I think so many of my team use it. It's just sped up some of the processes. It's a great top tip. And I do have an AI blog over on LinkedIn. So I'll make sure I find the link and share it to the comments. But what I've tried to do is I think AI scares so many people, and I think digital does. And what I've tried to do with the blog is just break it down to like a really easy read guide. Um, but equally, if there's anybody out there that probably hundreds of people that know a lot more about AI, if you want to write a piece for that blog, please do. It's all about just taking it, a bit like everything on the care end, and just giving it back into a bite size, easy to understand, free resource for the sector. I truly really believe Mark is a robot because I don't know where he finds the time. I mean, I finish work and I put my phone down. Mark must think I'm ghosting him half the time because I literally don't touch my phone throughout the day anymore. I just, I just can't. 
And I get home and I don't want to touch my phone when I get home. I literally sit down on my bed and go to sleep. Mark just powers out free resources, documents after document, advice and guidance after advice and guidance. I think it's incredibly, I think he's genetically cloned himself. I think there's yeah, three of them we've, there. we've already decided that Mark is the milk tray man. So if anyone out there is watching old enough to remember who the milk tray man is, you, you two don't remember. Mark is the milk tray man who could do all there sorts. Actually, the secret is a deep fake AI. Now that is getting into it a bit more. <laughs> Mark's not actually in a cafe at the moment. This is just a computer generated image being populated as we speak. It's just generative AI, all as, you know, as we live and breathe. Talking of the milk tray man, that wasn't the advert I was thinking of when I said it was soft. Diet Coke advert is the one that I was thinking of. Remember oh, yes. the Diet Coke time? Those were my yeah. favorite adverts when I was a kid. I thought they were really good. I was like, always, always wanted to work in an office building because I thought, God, if they were like the window cleaners, you know, I'm not a huge military fan, but Diet Coke. I was like, uh, yeah, you need to, one. after this, go onto YouTube and watch the old milk tray adverts, all because the lady loved milk tray. Are they as good as Bisto adverts? Because those were cracking adverts. They're better, I think. Really? I mean, Bisto yeah. adverts were like Golden Globe worthy. They were like, you know, give them a BAFTA or something because no, they these are better. Loved the oh, these are gonna, better. That's, what, that's my evening now. It's milk tray adverts on YouTube. That's what my life has become. Message Jane, me, let me know. <laughs> yes, oh, I will do. Don't you worry. Um, I will just spam your LinkedIn page with milk tray adverts now moving forwards. We are at our time now. And I do feel like this strategy is so meaty and so vast and so hopeful that we could talk about it for, for longer and I do want us to touch on this later on in the year when you're coming up to launch we'd love to you know do a feature on this and, and focus on it but also touching on it uh, periodically throughout the years as well to see how we're getting on and to see how we're monitoring it final words from you about this strategy what's you know what's really got you doing this is it and I, I know it's not just because it's a job but what's your driving force now because of the the strategy what what's 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 making your juices flow on this? That I truly believe it's the right time. And I think we are in the right set of circumstances with hope for the future. I think Skills for Care leading it is a really positive step forward because they've been able to get all of the key players around the table. Ona and David are really dynamic in that sense. They know everybody. Everybody trusts them to look after this properly and do this well and I just feel like we're in a moment in time and it's really exciting and really hopeful and I just keep clinging on to that that you know now it's got to happen now we just need it to happen and would love to come back and I will make sure the owner's with me next time and we we will join you together and it'll, let's go for something like just before the summer when we're kind of ready to launch it and we can give you some exclusives just before the summer post election yeah that's what it's going to be just before the summer post election. So. if you and if you know something that the rest of us don't i'm just going to rub my crystal ball and i don't know <laughs> i just i just think the the, the, the politics in this country are so in, uh, uh, unstable at this moment in time and finally finally psa for social care providers why should they care about this Mm, why should they care about this? Because I think this is going to be a really strong blueprint for them. Not only is it going to give care providers some hope for, for the future, for a more joined up voice, for a better approach to government, for, you know, a con kind of consistent way forward. I think it's going to give care providers some really strong blueprints and things that they can pick up and take forward um, and kind of do themselves. They're not going to have to wait for someone to do them for you do it for them that there'll be some really strong kind of stuff that comes out of it that they can do themselves oh, oh. I thought that was Mark again. I was like, oh, Mark's talking again now. No, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think it's, you know, absolutely incredible. And that was my cheeky way of getting some sound bites from you because Mark wants to do sound bites from the show now and I don't know how to do it. So I thought we'll get some good answers towards the end. Not that the whole show's not been great, but I just yeah, thought thanks. he's Easy pickables just right at the end there. Mark, uh, I feel like you're biased because you're on this panel of amazing experts as part of this plan, but anything you want to come in with before we disappear for the night and we leave you to your fourth coster? After this show, I'm getting straight back on the train and all the strides to get home. I, regardless of whether I was on one of my or not, I think 
we've spent so long talking about the issues within the social care for recruitment, retention. And I think if one of the positives of the pandemic has been actually this work strategy coming together, I think actually we should all get on board. It's now the chance, actually, like Jane said, where you've got the regulator that wants to be involved, you've got local authorities, ICBs that want to be involved. And Jane kind of has very well summed it up that actually it feels like a movement now. And actually, I think if you're, never get, if you're not going to get on board, I don't know when you're going to get on board. Because I think, I don't know at the time when you've had everybody together in one place that wants to make a movement. So it just, it does feel like the right time. And that's not me being biased because I'm on one of the, one of the books that's me talking as somebody who's long spoken about actually, we need something for the sector. And I feel like this is what we need for the sector. Yeah, I mean, I'll come from a point of view from, yeah, we all know we work in social care. We all know what jobs we do. We all know how busy we are when it comes to social care. I'm going to come from someone who's got family that needs care. You know, I, I need this to work so that my family can get the care and support they need. I need this to work so that I can rest easy knowing that if we need to increase care, put care in place, then actually that workforce is going to be there and they're going to have the skills and the tools they need to do this. Yeah, I want them to be happy in their roles. Yes, I want businesses to run smoothly. Yes, I want my job to be amazing and fab. And I want us to be able to provide the best working environments for our teams. But most importantly, I just want us to be able to do the best we can for the people who need us. Without them, what's the point in us? You know, without the people who need care, what the hell, is, what, what, what are we doing? Why are we doing what we do? So although this is a workforce strategy, it is very much rooted in the outcomes of, of um, the lives of the people we're supporting, isn't it? So we need this to work. We need you all behind it. But actually listening to you there, Adam, actually it's a strategy that's going to benefit us in the long term because we are going to need social care in the future. And actually yeah. that 15 year plan, actually many of us working in the sector will be drawing on social care by the time that strategy comes to an end, if it ever comes to an end. But yeah, all of us need it in the future. So now's the time to set that up for us. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, what a powerful end. What a powerful end of a wonderful show. Jane, I've missed your face so much. It's been so good having you on tonight. Thank you for having me on. You're most welcome, Mark. I hope those royalties will be coming in from Costa for this episode tonight because they've had so much free advertisement. Tell your cleaner we say hi. We saw her staring. It was very much like one of them news pieces. Do you know, like where are reporters in the street and people walk? Oh. We had a poking through the railings. You know, tell her we say hi. <laughs> <sighs> Mark isn't going to be in Costa next week. Um, he's also not going to be in Costa the week after. In fact, he's not even going to be on the show. He's going on a holiday for two weeks, um, which I'm incredibly jealous about. Um, I will be having a week off myself, but I'm committed to the Karen view and I will still be here. No, I'm joking. Mark is, as always, running the scenes um, in the background. I will be here on my own for the next two weeks, but don't let that put you off. I know Mark's the better looking of the two, and I know he's wonderful to look at. And he's very much just better me in general. Do join me still for the show. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to have two great weeks of it. www.thecareinview.co.uk. Uh, catch up on all of the stuff that we've got going on there. Check out Skills for Care. Make sure you're filling in your Ask WDS because you get money uh, if you do it properly. That's a good enough reason for anyone. But it also helps Jane and her team put together these fantastic strategies um, as we've already gone through. Links to the strategies are in the comments tonight. This is recorded. You can catch it up on YouTube, watch it back at any point that you want to, share it with your team, share it out there with people. Absolutely fine. Uh, but until then, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much, Mark, for making it work tonight on your side of things. Thank you, everyone, for joining and your comments and suggestions. Um, we will have to come, maybe we'll go live with a poll, embedding social care. I think that's a good one. How do we embed social care? Not fix it. How do we embed it? How do we embed social care back into society? I, I quite like that. Coining it, coining it from the Care Review, maybe. But yes, do join us for our shows over the next two weeks. Sound off in the comments if you're watching this on Catch Up, and we'll catch up on the comments at a later time. But until then, thank you so much and good night.